Good everything. I like the music. I like everything. Hi. Hi, Dr. Carr and all of the Nubians and everybody, wherever you are in the world. Good everything. The drop is hot. Oh, but my limited God. time only. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm I uh we both grew up in the era of like hip hop clothing. And I, I remember it not necessarily being for women, <laughs> you know, the stuff was baggy and things, and um but you could wear stuff with pride, the black medallions and the, you know, Queen Latifah, the, the you know, the crown that, that was worn. And there was a sense of belonging to a culture, to a people uh, and a sense of self for a minute. Right. And then uh, then we started wearing other people's uh, brands that branded us and then uh, made those very popular, even though they don't want they don't want us wearing it. I want you all to wear this. I want you to wear it with pride, whether it's past the baton and these drops, you know, I took a page from Telfar. Uh, cause you know, you know, you, you, you build, you build through us with what people want, you know, you're not begging people to, to buy stuff. So that's right. Yeah. So thank you uh, for letting me play the little commercial. What are you talking about? We, we're all in this, this, we the global majority. I'm look black owned for us by us. That used to be us, right? For us. Yes. By us, yeah. and I, we from that era. Right? So yes, yes, so, yes. Yeah. Watching 19 year olds build empires, you know, uh, Damon out there now shark tanking, but started with some caps in the in the streets of of, of Queens, no Hollis question. in them, and uh, you know, watching watching folk uh then turned into something that um mm, we need to just go back and remember who we are. Remember yeah, I was I was listening to the conversation you were having with the brother about affirmative action, and uh I, you know. Respect everybody. We all got. We all building. We're all pursuing. They couldn't quite get his mind around what you were saying. You were. You know, so, so let me. It's good, as you said, it's good. We need to talk. You it know. was. A, it was a spillover because you know I rarely do that. So I got the three hours on the radio, which is can be exhausting. So <laughs> depending on you know. Oh, I'm the, sure that's an understatement. Yeah, three. You no, know, I mean, actually, I, I, I I'm energized usually because the conversations. Yeah. I mean, three hours with Doctor Black. I mean, think about it. Three yeah, hours but, yeah. Like, like, like Mark and them say, jazz artists create a masterpiece by midnight. You're exhilarated, and then you they wake crash. up a day later, like, what, what just happened? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, but, I'm doing that Monday through Friday. And, yeah. but for me, I don't get tired because where do we have these conversations? You know, like it's, yeah. it's not even like Gil Noble or Tony, you know, Tony Brown's journal. These are live conversations that are being had that I'm not necessarily, I'm not sitting there with, you know, a, a gotcha sheet where I'm trying to pick somebody apart. I'd like want to have a conversation. I need to understand. So Jared Lowell, who is an attorney, Morehouse grad, oh, Harvard yeah. grad, all of the th grads who also is a lobbyist, who's also in them streets helping to get money and funds, working with the po politicians. He has entree to something that I don't have and a knowledge of things behind the, behind the curtain. I'm talking to us about what we can get done. I'm not worried about what's behind the curtain because we we either will show up and vote or we won't. We either will control our politicians or we won't. But what we can and must do is control our communities. So Absolutely. we can do that. So so I'm like, all right, give me the information and then let us form strategies around, okay, this group of people, you're going to go bang these politicians every day. You're going to bang them because you got the energy. You retire folk, as you were talking, call up, call, hey, my grandbaby's not getting, you know, like, mm -hmm. let's have a strategy since you got churches. Let's let's stop with you know giving me your time, giving your time, and let's figure out in the church where we used to how to navigate these these levers of power so that we can be served. So I brought him, I, I kept him because I was like, I got more questions. Will you jump on the stream yard with me? So he did. He came into the YouTube uh, live, which I rarely do, but um, I, I did it not. Was, it, it was really something though really to hear that conversation you did well, not sorry you did not I, win it. I didn't expect him to resist what I was saying so I'm you always he's a Morehouse grad of course he's gonna resist it and the HBCUs are really DEI used these days I mean oh my god we, so we try we try we try to get put on I mean for a man to say that the aspirate when you can when you 
presented the example of uh, Deion Sanders at Jackson State and said, if you had a five-year plan and rooted in the soil, and his response was, yeah, maybe it'd get to this level of Southern Mississippi. That's when I understood that y'all talking about two different things. He, he's, he's still measuring himself by white folk, which is fine. I mean, that's what they do at HBCs. But uh, I know because I work at one and fight it every day gloriously. But more importantly, what you are demonstrating and modeling and following in the tradition of and, and extending is black self-determination. That's quite so something quite different. And, and so the things can work together. As you say, you access the information, let's network. But I would not want that mentality in front of my children. Yes. Do not aspire to enhance Harvard. You were trying to help the brother, <laughs> but you know that's fine. You just you, you 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 contribute, but you can't be directing. <laughs> so part, part of part of part of my my shock sometimes is you know I was like, all right, I know you we on the radio, but now we over here, nah. right? Then I was like, oh, this is how you really this this is how you really feel. Okay, you know, I, I that's thought, always yeah. listening. The mentality is that mass is always listening. Well, let him hear some things. Well, yeah, him, but I mean, let him you know. quake in his boots a little bit. Let him fear. <laughs> he stay quaking his boots. That's yeah. all they do is quake in their boots. The boots are stay quaking. The boots okay, stay quaking. well, let, let them quake more. Let them fall off. Let the <laughs> let the laces get frayed. You know, like we we busy like let's smooth out the. Let, don't let them be too upset. Oh, oh my yeah. goodness, we don't. You right, know, so, and then that going to did you see? I'm sure you did. You may even commented on it. Uh, Warren Buffett is getting ready to give away some more billions. And there was a breakdown. I don't know if it was in today's time. Oh, it wasn't in today's paper. But uh, I want to say $160 billion is the projected possible amount that he will give away. He's 92 now. And they were enumerating the billions he has given away. But because Berkshire stock has increased in value, even as he has been giving it away, and of course we talked about it on a on a huge scale relative to where we are, but on a tiny scale relative to where he is, of course, with Mackenzie Scott, as she's been giving away stuff, she's still getting richer. So is he. Yes. So you're not going to compete dollar for dollar with this system. What you do have control over is yourself, and that begins with your mentality. So it's a very different. You were really trying to teach that lesson. That was fascinating well, for me to hear that conversation. You I know. mean, but, but beyond that, I mean, you take Warren Buffett, Omaha, who still lives in Omaha, still lives in a house that he bought fifty something years ago. Same house. Started with a paper, uh, you know, paper route, and and then started investing ninety years ago. Mm -hmm. Started investing ninety years ago. Mm -hmm. This is this is what generational wealth compound interest, compounding wealth looks like in one person during a span of time, right? He's able to time travel because he's investing in things as they're just coming up before they blow up. And then he can't give away his $5 billion. I think he, he's uh, going to be giving five, That's the latest one. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. $50 billion, 50, five, zero, $50 billion he's given away. But And, and, and still going to have more than more what he's Right. So I'm saying that if we started right now, all of us, you know, you got your little babies investing, you opening up your child, that five year old, six year old, 10 year old, opening up an investment, uh, you know, portfolio for them. Shout out to now. Derek Hamilton, my brother, Derek Hamilton, the economist, and of course, the governor of Maryland, uh, Wes Moore, and this whole concept of baby bonds. Right. And of course, we did that growing up. I mean, our parents did that for us, got the little savings bonds, no question. Let me tell you, when I got out of college, you know, I got savings bonds for high school. A lot of my, my parents' friends. Oh, no question. Man, did they come in handy? Help me put a down payment on a condo. Those bonds matured over that five, six, seven year period. Teach. You know, but we we don't. And, and I used to give out when you can give paper bonds. Every time a friend of mine would have a baby, I would give them, uh, you know, paper bond. Martin Luther King, because they had people's faces on them. Yes. And if I, would, if I had money that month, it would be a Marion Anderson. Come on, quite, come quite on, Quite a problem. pity, you know. But you... you <laughs> You 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 don't if you don't have vision for like the long game and you 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 have definitely helped me see that through W. B. Du Bois. A man had a hundred year plan and he Come had on. no intention of being here to see it to fruition. But if you can't visualize beyond your own existence, then we don't have any hope as a people. That's and right. they do. They are constantly. And they're not even thinking about their grandchildren. They think about their great great grandchildren. Come when on. Cardi B tells Tasha <laughs> Tasha K, I'm gonna make sure your great grandchildren have no money. That's vision on the negative side. How we about that? And on the positive sense, when uh, when Jay Z says Bleak could be one hit away his whole career, as long as I'm alive, he's a millionaire. <laughs> in other words, when he lays out everybody in the rock, you know, Freeway and Foxy, I'm no, I'm, I'm, when you see me, that was in uh, what Diamonds Are Forever, him and Kanye, the remix, which is of course when him and Dame was still cold. 
you know, you see his yeah. name okay yet? He said, you got to get off the boat to walk on water. <laughs> a lot of people lined up to see the Titanic sinking. Instead, I rise from the ash like a phoenix. Not to put the Titanic in it, but the wow. point is this. <laughs> At the end of the day, you got to have vision. And that's what you were trying to teach that day. I mean, hey, Dion, whatever, brother. And we covered that, of course, in detail. Sit in the soil for five years. You're not going to have the huge stadium this year or next year or 10 years from now. But at some point, and see, that that was the real tragedy of Deion Sanders. This isn't a critique of him. He just what he didn't have that vision. He, the real tragedy was in that moment, he had tapped into something we've never lost. When old folks used to sing in church, build your hope on things eternal. You know, people said, oh, you the one? Let's do it. And then you get up and go out there with them buffalo, bruh. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll recover. You weren't the one. But don't mistake that with we not going to get there because you have probably overvalued yourself, which is good as an individual, but you had a chance right. to accelerate it. Got to have a vision. Got to. Otherwise, we'll be on John Harbor's plantation forever. As you were talking, I was thinking to myself, you know, as you were trying to explain to him, Harbor, I was thinking about, uh, what's the brother? Um, Craig Stephen Wilder, who wrote the book Ebony and Ivy about slavery and the roots of the Ivy League. I'm saying, I'm sure while you were up at John Harbor's plantation, you found out how John Harbor made his money in the Caribbean, in plantations. So your ancestors did that. Don't do not do that, bro. Don't do that. You, you act like Harvard was always Harvard. And it's always going to be Harvard as long as you point into it. That's always my point. Like, mm -hmm. did, it, did it just jump out? As, you know, exactly. Like, somebody had a vision to create this thing called an Ivy League. Come on. Um, Instead of us trying to mirror that, we got a thousand years that we can mirror. That's even greater if we just tapped into it and recreated it in this time. We have the ability. We will. We will. We will. I know. I, I mean, I, we, we will stop. because you know, that's what this is. That's, that's what, what this drive. That's what the global majority that's is. What I'm that's saying. Everything you're involved in, we're building. Yeah, um, it, it actually motivates me. So I, while I was exhausted after that conversation, I was like, okay, <laughs> this is stay in the lab. Let's just keep going. Let's just keep stay going. In the lab. On that note, uh, you out in them streets again, I, I see. I'll sir. be staying in, you know, the staying <laughs> in the streets. Out, I, out in those streets. What you I doing? Mean, I might need to, in fact, this time, I am, I don't know. I'm going to risk it because I can pick it up now. I'm getting a little bit better with the technology. Okay. Can you see what's out there? That looks like a cemetery. That's exactly where I am. You're, you're at I'm the first wow. national, as AJ um, Orlikoff, who's the director of public engagement at the place I am right now, as he said, national with a small end, um, the first national cemetery in the social structure we live in here called the United States of America. Uh, it is known now as the historic congressional cemetery in Southeast DC. A little different part of Southeast D.C. than where I was at Seed a couple of weeks ago, Seed Public Charter School, not too far from Seed, uh, right down the street from D.C. General, the old hospital. But I'm here because 10 years ago, this September, um, they had the funeral here of Elaine Leroy Locke. This is where Alan Locke is buried. And uh, A.J., A.J. Orlikoff, as I said, the director of public engagement, his crew, Sarah, and some of the folk here at the cemetery reached out to me a few months ago and said, would you come to give a few remarks on Elaine Locke? Because they have started here. This is their first uh, guided tour. Uh, early, later on, Brother Charles is going to be the, uh, the docent that takes us through. They have walking tours here, one for African-Americans, one for suffragettes and uh, women. Uh, they have another one for LBGT uh, community. And today they are combining the LBGT community and the African American community, the folks who are buried here in the spirit of Elaine Locke, who of course was black and gay. And so I, you know, when they reached out to me, I said, sure. And I thought, hmm, okay, why are you reaching out to me? And I, it's, I talked to the, the NFL staff uh, on Thursday about Juneteenth, which was they say, why y'all reach out to me? Said, Somebody put my name out there. was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did. I said, see, I'm, a bl I'm blaming everybody. My former students, all the people. And I'm blaming you. I'm blaming I So, but anyway, I, 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 of course, said I would be honored because I was at Elaine Locke's funeral 10 years ago. And I'm going to wow. tell my story at his grave, which is, a, and of course, they're going to hear it second because we'll talk about it this morning. But we're in that corridor. We're in the corridor between Juneteenth 
and July 4th. And I think every year that we continue, this is going to get more and more beautifully messy. Because they hurried up and made Juneteenth a federal holiday before they thought about it. And you done messed up now. Because this, 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 I think this look, this, this 16 days, Juneteenth, June 19th, July 4th, July 4th, you count those two days. But if you take June 19th and July 4th out, it's literally two weeks. This two-week corridor is probably going to be the time from now on, as long as there's the United States, which might not be a whole lot longer, but we don't know. But we're going to renegotiate the terms. And then we're going to talk about that today. We're going to oh, talk wow. about that today in terms of Elaine Lott. The confronting hypocrisy, the, the mirror. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you know, my, how does this work? Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, even a three-year-old is going to be like, so right. freedom, but hey, you win. Right. <laughs> That's right. First of all, um, playing playing your our Juneteenth conversation on what was it um, public radio? I, oh, I yeah, shout out to Katia Stitt, the Please. general manager at the Pacifica Network. W uh, uh, here in D.C. is WPFW in New York is WBAI. And on Juneteenth, they asked for permission. You said, sure, or tell them, please. And they played our conversation, three-hour conversation, uncut, direct, over the Pacifica Network. I mean, people, man, we, people- have We do that more frequently, because I've gotten a lot of feedback. Folk were driving yeah. around, were like, hey, wait, is that Karen chuckling in the background? Wait a minute. Wait that, a minute. It, yeah. yeah, no, it, apparently it did, you know, it's, people were listening. Yeah, um, well, Pacifica's so, a huge, it's a huge network. I mean, you know, they got the stations in, in Houston, uh, L.A., uh, the flagships in New York and D.C. This was the uh, network that was founded by pacifists right after World War II. It is not commercial. It is listener supported. Uh, it is radical public radio. In fact, national public radio in many ways has its roots in the Pacifica network. And so Katia Stitt, whose father, by the way, the great jazz musician Sonny Stitt, Katia is a treasure. She was a road manager for many years for Sweet Honey and the Rock. Katia texted me and said, you think Karen, oh, oh, by the way, she said, Karen Hunter is a rock star. I didn't tell you what she said about you, but now I get to say it. She said, I want to meet her so bad. Oh, wow. So I'm, I'm just saying, Katia, and Katia is a, Katia is a monster. She, she's the general manager of WPF for many, many years. But well, yeah. I was going to ask you to introduce us because I feel like there, you know, again, this, this is <laughs> yes. no, but I'm like, if, when you asked me, I was like, yeah, like it's out, it's out there. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. But I feel like there could be a more pointed, you know, conversation around how we can engage with that audience and, and mm -hmm. get more of, of what you're talking about out there. That absolutely. <laughs> This is what collaboration is supposed to look like. You know? That's what it's like, supposed yeah. to look like. I, so, I saw, uh, I didn't see it, but uh, Roman Martin mentioned it. Did you see this thing with uh, the brother, uh, what's his name, Carlos? Talking about the, 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 the Oxy, Ani, whatever. And it's so funny because we were talking about it before I saw it anywhere else. Because remember, he, he had the insert in the Sunday New York Times, and we were talking about it, showed him, and now he's saying now that it was racism. It was racism that made these people come get me. I'm like, really? Is that what we're talking about? You was taking up all the oxygen in the room, raising all the money in the room. But this is, and again, going back to your conversation yesterday. Well, this every, is what happens you, know, you don't build. This, I mean, the, from jo Jonathan Majors, I'm going to say it, from Jonathan Majors to Carlos <laughs> Watson, sometimes, sometimes you get yourself in a jam and racism becomes an easy out, but then it also undermines the, the actual fight. So, right. you know, if you, if you hear me silent mostly on these things, it's because um, I know that that's some BS. And I'm not <laughs> gonna be out here like defending <laughs> something that I'm like, dude. Um, you all up in these white people's faces, all up in it, all up in there with mm -hmm. your non background having ass, right? <laughs> <laughs> None of the work was put That's in, right. but That's you right. now have crafted this media pu public relations image that white people buy because they're gonna buy some Theranos and they're gonna buy some fire. They they're gonna put some money into things that don't exist because that's that's how the, we got this uh, criminal enterprise, right? This is no what question. they do. This but is part do. of their DNA. They fund they things do. that don't exist because yeah. every now and then you might have a United States, right? That's so, right. Yeah, and and so when it blows up, when your fraud uh, comes back around, it's oh, it's racism. No, you got no. in on some. Um, anyway, let's move. No, on. no, no, no. This is this is very important. And it's very germane to today. Um, yesterday, if I was at, if I was at home, I could get yesterday's New York Times. I don't have it with me. There was an article in the style section, I don't think it was the business section, style section on black hair care products. And one of these white companies, 
and I probably could remember it in a minute, but it doesn't matter because they're all the exact same. Uh, the, the headline, you know, on the bottom of the fold on the front page of the Times, they give you little teasers, as you know better than I do. And one of the teasers was um, the long neglected, something like that, off neglected black hair care market is now uh, being opened and people are trying to cater, trying to get at that market. And then there's this picture of his sister with her hair uh, out and she's like, yes, and I'm like, right. she's, you see it? Oh, Look at I, it. I, Let me and I'm I'm saying, see, this is what happens. Now, we've already conceded too much of our personal care market to non-African people. But at the same time, and then, of course, with Ajiwa and the work she's doing with all of her allies and co-conspirators on the Crown Act, including trying to get it into the federal uh, law, and, of course, still being fought all over the country by people who want to punish Black people because we just want to do our hair how the hell we want. But in that respect, here come this market. Well, so when you see these cats like Carlos Watson, them, these people can't do anything to us that we don't allow them to do. So you put $11 D trillion behind this dude and thought if you carpet bombed us, we was going to look at him. It don't work like that. Oh, you got it? There it is. Now, I'm not saying, you know, in the cultural meaning making, I'm saying, why you pick this picture? And, you know, now she's immortalized in in the, the science technology of the social structure. And I'm like, wow, really? But, but what that story really is about is there it is. You see? Yeah, this alarm works to understand black hairs, black women's hair. So that's Unilever. not one that our sisters run then, because we understand our hair. Unilever. There you go. What you think about that, Prof? Uh. <laughs> they coming. But 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 they can't stop what we're doing. And, and, and I think that's, to me, that is really the lesson. Like today, in a few minutes when we go and, and start can, this can you, can you pause there for a second, though? Yeah. No, let's do it. Let's pause. Um, from Annie Malone to Madam C.J. Walker, we, you know, we have revolutionized hair care, even for right. folk that uh, have very little melanin, but very uh, co- coilish hair from the from our Jewish brothers and sisters <laughs> to, to our Italian brothers and sisters who would iron, literally iron their hair when mm-hmm. Madam C.J. Walker got that that gift of a French uh, presser. And, and immortalized that, took Annie Malone's formula and went around with her marketing mm-hmm. husband to create uh, an industry which was the precursor to Mary Kay and 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 Come on now. got a lot of black women off of their knees washing people. Come on now. She was one of the first people we talked about. One of them first in yeah. classes, you walked us through Annie Malone and Poro and Madam C.J. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you think about how many black women didn't have to wash white folks' asses because these women created an industry around beauty and hair hair care that yep. now is dominated by people who are not black. That's right. Koreans, Koreans have hair care uh, supply stores and they control it. I'm like, how did that happen? I'm like, so, so baffled. Like, who gave it away? You know, we had the Bronner Brothers and all this coming up, That's the right. hair shows. That's and right. We control, I mean, even the Jerry Curl uh, era, you know. Um, What's up, the Johnson, not Bob Johnson, uh, not, not, not. No, uh, it, was, it was Johnson, but not Bob Johnson and not, not, uh, not, not Johnson. our Johnson from Ebony. It wasn't that Johnson either. I can That's guess. right. Uh, oh, um, What's the name of it? Um, but yeah, Afro Sheen and all that, right. And I mean, then of course, the, the Ebony about, Fashion uh, Fair. Johnson Hair Care, who owns it, the company, the company, Johnson probably held uh, Chicago. So it might have been John, George E. Johnson George Johnson, and his yeah. wife, Joan. Uh, yeah. He was a barber who later, you know, she was a barber uh, and, and a barber. They they took a $250 loan, $250 loan and developed this whole entire Afro sheen and everything, which also then gave us. Um, Soul Train. Soul Train was right. completely powered. That's right. By black products. That's right. And that's to me. I'm like, that's what right. happened? What and, happened? And do you remember? Do you remember the uh, the commercial where the brother was trying to get his fro together, and it was on Soul Train. And then he looks in the mirror, and who's standing there but Frederick Douglass? <laughs> Frederick Douglass is like, oh, here, brother, you should use this. And it's like an Afro Sheen commercial. <laughs> I, said, what? I mean. But that we, we, we're we getting back there, though, bro. I mean, to, to kind of to bring, as you say, talk about apparel in this season of, of a drop of the latest from Global Majority. Um, 
you know, when I was at Odunde, you see all these shirts now. People tell people been selling t-shirts. I told them when Barack Obama was elected, black folk got they took their reparation one t-shirt stand at a time. <laughs> they done sold Barack Obama calendars, the whole family t-shirt. Anyway, I saw a number of shirts that said, This hair I have is not, and then you got Indian crossed out, you got Korean crossed out, you got synthetic crossed out. We're, we're clawing our way back to that. This is, and this is something Elaine Locke talked about in terms of what he would call uh, cultural pluralism. You know, Locke was one of the pioneers in saying race is not biological, race is not a reality. Sure, there are medical implications in terms of, you know, people come from different places, but he says culture. Culture is the important thing, and we need to hold on to our culture, and our culture doesn't start here in the United States. I, you know, when I see now everywhere, people with their hair like your hair, people with their hair like my hair, meaning what? You style it any kind of way you want, but increasingly, it's being styled after you don't do anything other than style the way it came out of your scalp. It is remarkable to go into any number of places, not just the cultural places, not just what they used to call the crunchy places when I was in school in the 80s and 90s with the Afro Center, the Love yeah. Jones place. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm, I'm literally at the White House or I'm in Congress walk and nobody, I don't see your perm. Come on. I mean, and no, don't just, <laughs> yeah, however you want to wear your hair, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. This isn't a criticism. But, I'm just saying but, it's, you know, you have seen I, that. I just discovered cod liver oil and a little olive oil. Come on now. So, like, I was like, cod liver oil? <laughs> my, my mother used to, my grandmother, you know, it's like we could get back and it costs absolutely very cheap. You know, That's you put some oil on before you wash your hair to keep the moisture locked in. Little, you know, it's like we are we are discovering the beauty of us and that we don't have to chase these, first of all, aesthetics, but also these products. I have a friend of mine that went to like 50 different stores to find one product that was black owned. Cause it was like almost out of, out of print or whatever you call it, you know, wow. continued. She was like, I am going to track this down. I'm going to spend whatever I need to spend because mm. I'm going to support this particular brand because it works on my hair. And then, but then you think of, and I, I, I don't blame people for selling out from Carol's daughter to shave moisture because it's really hard to walk away from a hundred million dollars or $50 million. Of, you know, most of us have never seen that money. Most of us will never see that money, but no, I'm like, how much money do you, you know, at some point, like, Mm, I get it. You know, those infrastructures, but someone had to start to have those infrastructures, those infrastructures, you don't leave it. It just popped out the womb and was Unilever. That's they right. Built over time. And like, that's right. We take the time to build an infrastructure. That's right. Well, there you go. Can we build an infrastructure and what does it take? It takes vision. Sometimes an individual. When we have institutions, the record speaks for itself. When we build a place for us to gather, what comes out of those places literally transforms the world, beginning with transforming ourselves. This is this is the lesson. It, 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 now, we have some challenges. Can I take a, a, just one second? No, um, come on, let's do it. Because, you know, three years ago, there was a pandemic and we, we wanted a place where we could gather. That's um, right. we, we, we figured really quickly that the YouTube uh, was too too vast and too full of trolls to have a meaningful dialogue in, in the chat and, you know, to mm -hmm. have the the kind of working through things with each other. We don't have to agree, but there has to be an understanding that we're coming here with a purpose and then folk would just be jumping in and then we have to fix <laughs> you know, Which is what happens, out. no question. How you, and then I'm in there and I'm not listening to you. And I was like, mm. so we created Nubia as, as a defense to, and now it's developing into mm. something else. And we, we're working behind the scenes on like what comes next, because that was a, a stopgap measure to address a need at the time. But now the needs are so much more. So we got groups in there. We got, of course, our amazing, um, you know, resource guide and bookshelf and, and, and narrative. And, and as communities develop in, you know, the groups in Nubia, it's like, what's next but if we really think about it we've only been doing that for two years so That's now right. i have to sit down and map out with team like what happens over the next five years what happens over the next 10 years and i know for everyone that's in there it's like well let's do this and let's do this and let's do this and let's <laughs> you gotta you gotta just sit and kind of like what needs to happen what do we need yes we need political action committees we need think tanks we need you know we need these things that we talk about here how do you develop them 
who's going to be in charge. We, we made an attempt at like having some sort of group, but even that's difficult if everyone's not on the same page or they're yeah, coming. It has to be, yeah, it, it has to be. Yeah. Yeah. So time. I'm just saying like the patience that is required. A lot of times we don't think about the 400 years of patience our ancestors had because they kept singing about freedom, but it didn't most of them never saw it for us to be here now on the other side of it and to see all of the progress because there's been progress. I'm not we're not still enslaved and we're not still mm -hmm. in Jim Crow and we're not still in a lot of things. So I, I want to say that out of my mouth. A lot of us are way better off than our grandparents and great grandparents. That's but true. As we move forward, a lot of us also don't have the sense of the ice water being colder or more importantly, like we never going to do that. As, as Jared was like, we never going to have anything as nice as that. And in the very notion of you saying that tells me that you don't get, like they didn't have it. So you telling me we can't do something that they did. Well, you're also looking in the mirror and saying I'm not as good as them. I know it's very painful to consider, but when you look in the mirror and tell yourself that somehow you are less than these other people because of the color of your skin, that you got a deep problem going on. Now you could pretend that you could be mad, but don't get mad. Get smart, as John Clark would say. Because what are you saying? What are you really saying, bro? What so, really Doctor Carr, how how do you reach those deep recesses of people's souls? That you know, have that have that coded in there in, into their psyche, and they don't even recognize it. Like, how do you how do you? Uh, uh, that that's that's a th that's what we're doing, right? I mean, as you say, it's funny on um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday night over at Sankofa, I had a conversation. Um, shout out to the staff at, at, at Sankofa. Um, sometimes when they have an author coming, and they do an author events all the time, but. Uh, they asked me if I would moderate a conversation, be in conversation with, and then open it up for a larger conversation with uh, a very good brother, an Eritrean brother who has been in the United States since, I think, 1971 or two, um, to Sarah Cabrin, Professor Sarah Cabrin, who, Sarah, Sarah Cabrin, who is a philosopher by training at Morgan State University for decades. Um, he has edited a new edition of a very important work called Return to the Source. This is an edited collection of speeches, of writings of Amilcar Cabral. Of course, Amilcar Cabral, as many folk no doubt know, and for the young people in particular who may not know that name, C-A-B-R-A-L. Um, and Sarah Cabrahan is S-E-R-E-Q-U-E B. E R H A N Sarah Cabrahan, Professor Sarah Cabrahan, but um he edited a, a new edition of Return to the Source. Uh, Amilcar Cabral, who was born in Guinea, now Guinea Bissau, uh, whose parents were from Cape Verde, the islands right off of Guinea Bissau, West Africa, formerly Portuguese Guinea. Um, he was born there, and he was assassinated in 1973, January 1973, by some of the members of his own political party, PAIGC, uh, which was the Organization for the Liberation of Guinea and, and Cape Verde. But he was assassinated with the complicity of the Portuguese who were all about murdering Amakar Cabral. Um, at that time, Portugal claimed what is now Angola, Mozambique, Guinea, Portuguese Guinea, and Cape Verde. But I bring him up because we had a very good conversation. If y'all go over to San Copa's website, you can see the conversation we had on Thursday, on Wednesday night. But in the conversation, the reason I'm bringing it up now because you asked, how do we get people to that space? Amakar Cabral is best known. And when you think about Cabral, you're really thinking about that generation that produced Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, the generation that produced Sekou Toure in Guinea. Conakry, which is where he was assassinated, by the way, uh, Cabral was. Uh, Julius Nereri in Tanzania, he fought like that. Also, on the other end of the spectrum, stooges like Hastings Banda in Malawi, um, Joseph Mobutu in Congo after the U.S. colluded with Belgium and the rest to take out Patrice Lumumba. But anyway, Cabral is best known out of all of these kind of liberation leaders, freedom fighters, he is best known for his assertion that the principal struggle when you're trying to build a different society for people of African descent 
is the cultural struggle. Uh, the second to last chapter in Professor Sarah K. Rand's newly edited collection of Cabral's talks and, and writings is a meeting that Cabral had in 1972 in New York City with Africans of the diaspora. It's a fascinating figure, uh, Makar Cabral, because uh, he traveled the world. Um, he interacted with everyone. You know, he raised in, 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 in Guinea, went to school in Portugal, worked in Angola as an agriculturalist. He was trained to deal with agriculture, an agronomist, not an agricultural agronomist is, is the formal title. And when he committed to what became a decade long struggle for the liberation of African people in Guinea and Cape Verde, he said, in order to fight and resist colonialism, it isn't enough to fight colonialism. We have to do that. France Fanon, of course, is, is of that generation. You know, the question of violence, how do you use violence? It, can violence transform you by purging yourself of this? Again, you wanna fight. And you have to fight, we have to fight. He said, but while we are fighting, we must develop internal mechanisms for self-determination and that means returning to our culture. And that's where it gets tricky. What does it mean to return to your culture? Because you can't undo the past. Cabral is very, very specific about this. You can't go back to pre-invasion Africa. And even if you could, you shouldn't. Why right? because everything there was not perfect. He has a very severe critique when it comes to what we might call now clitorindectomy, female genital mutilation, for example. Absolutely. When we talked about, we talked about Ralph Bunch a few weeks ago when Ralph Bunch was in East Africa. And he said, you know, y'all act like all these African people all think alike because they're from the same nation or what you would call a tribe. He said, no, they're having a real argument over here about this female genital mutilation, what we would call that. And they don't agree. Some of these elders are like, this is crazy. Why are y'all doing this? And then the response partially is, well, we, we show, we're doing this so we can preserve our culture because we're not the British. He said, that's not a good enough reason. So what Cabral says ultimately is, as you are returning to the source, to who you are as African people, as you're reconnecting to your cultural values, as you're reconnecting to your rituals, as you're reconnecting, as we might put it in the Africana Studies framework, to your cultural meaning making and your ways of knowing, understand that you're going to take from that culture what is very valuable. You're going to leave the things that are not valuable and the things that are partially valuable and maybe not as valuable here. You're going to figure out how to remix them or leave them or take them. How are you going to do it? And of course, he has a famous uh, saying in another book that he uh, Cabral did called um, was published posthumously called Revolution in Guinea. There's an essay in there called Tell No Lies claim no easy victories, where he says, we have to confront this question as we continue to develop. But this is what Cabral, where I'm going. He says, when you immerse like that, and remember when they were struggling against the Portuguese, most of Guinea was not urban. And the parts that were urban, the major cities that were urban, and by major, I mean small cities, but those cities were still from people who were from the country, which of course we as African people in the diaspora, particularly the United States are well familiar with. Yeah, you might be from Chicago, you might be from Newark, you might be from Philly or Detroit, but you still got people down south. And there was a time fairly up until fairly recent, and still some people do it where you send your people down south, they still go into the country. So even the people in the city from the country, and that was very true in Guinea, what Cabral says is that we're going to fight the Portuguese. By the time they had achieved independence in 1973, they were in control, meaning the revolutionaries were in control of three quarters of the country. They had driven because the Portuguese could not go in the country and follow them. And while they were out there, they built clinics, they built schools, they built uh, all forms of institutions that could literally create a governance framework to help them resist, but to, more importantly, to build something so that as they overthrew and threw out these colonialists, they were not going to replicate colonialism in the way they operated. And, and so what, what Cabral says, if you throw them out, and keep their institutions, they're still here. They're in your minds. This is what I think about that conversation you were having. He said, what you've done is you've replaced their class structure with their class structure, except the only thing you replaced were the people. So you got a bourgeoisie, or what he would call a petty bourgeoisie, because Negroes ain't got that Warren Buffett money, but you damn near aspiring to it, which means you're a small bourgeoisie, a petty bourgeoisie. And you will do anything not to have to be with those people who you see as beneath you, the hood people, the bush people, as they may say in West Africa, the country Negroes, the Bamas, 
that we might sit here. And I'm a proud Bama, son of a Bama, son of two Bamas. But the point is this, Cabral says, if you're gonna say culture, you can't romanticize it. You can't go back to a mythical past, but you must go to the source and bring forward the things that are valuable. And what's going to finally allow us to build, we have to be inclusive. This is what they learned in the bush. This is what they learned in the countryside as they're building, as they're helping people read and write, as they're helping people acquire the skills, as they're training nurses and doctors, as they're training teachers. You're gonna have to go and be with the people and you're gonna have to leave all that bourgeois pretension wherever you picked it up from. Cabral calls it class suicide. It isn't enough to come say, I'm gonna help these people. No, uh-uh, who is these people? No, you, and this is this is the lesson of Ella Jo Baker. This is the lesson of Septima Clark. We've covered this many times before. And of course, I'm saying that for people who may not have known those, those names, but for most of us, we, we know who we're talking about. And Cabral, by the way, when he's having this conversation around the world, whether it be in Europe, whether it be in Africa, whether it be Che Guevara, he's in conversation with the Cubans. Of course, he's with Secretary Ray and Kwame Nkrumah, who he's very close to in the United States. He's having conversations with the Congressional Black Congress. I'm talking about Charles Diggs and them boys, not the crew who is there now, although, you know, distinctions maybe. Anyway, my point is this. These are all not the same places. He says, you got to adapt your struggle to wherever you are. And then we link up. He said, if I didn't have to fight my struggle in Guinea, I might come here to the United States and be with y'all, brothers and sisters. He says, but brothers and sisters is very important. That's affection, that's shared origin, that's common oppression that we're fighting. He said, but it's more important once we know we brothers and sisters to be comrades. And there's where culture gets a definition. It's returning to the source, the ways of knowing, but it's also creating formations that have us not replicate the oppressive system where some of us think we're better than others because we got a car or two cars or somebody come help clean up the house or, or $5 in the bank or $50,000 in the bank or half a million in the bank. He says, that's what creates the class tension and class suicide means you got to come off that, not come down into the class, no, eliminate that concept. That is the most difficult thing because we aspire to replace our oppressors. Now, this is where I think today for me, and by that I mean today, June, 2023, being out here at the Congressional Cemetery, a social structure space in a, a, a settler colony turned settler state called United States of America, that is probably permanently, as long as there is a country called United States of America, we're gonna be renegotiating the terms because of the bloody way that it was started. And some of that blood is out here, you know, as AJ and Sarah were talking, I was picking up some of the uh, some of the maps and some of this is one of the, you know, you give the guided tours, right? So, you know, John Philip Sousa is out here. You know, uh, my man is out here. I told him last time I was out here, Marion Berry, mayor for life. He's in the same neighborhood as J. Edgar Hoover, if you can imagine that, Cokie Roberts. And there are veterans of the War of 1812 out here. And there are a number of African people out here. This is the one on African-Americans. There are a number of Africans out here. This is what they call the pre-Civil War graves. You see 1825 to 1860. They don't know how many of these Africans were enslaved, but these are some of the Africans who were buried before they had compensated emancipation. Abraham Lincoln paying the slave masters to let us go. But I'm saying all that to say that, you know, while this thing, this social structure is under constant tension, constant fracture, com constant remaking, perhaps. And as we are here in this corridor between Juneteenth and July 4th, giving us a, a window, I think, which was going to, I think, become an annual ritual of reevaluation, reassessment of where, quote unquote, we are, whatever we means, depending on the context. The possibilities of self-determination, of returning to the source, as Cabral might say it, of class suicide, as he might say it, today gives us an opportunity. I mean, this session of In Class gives us an opportunity to think about how class plays a role. Most of us are what James Turner will call the laboring class. We work, we gotta work, can't miss no checks, can't miss no meals, and we gotta pay for the meals. You know, even if we own a business, which is most black businesses are single 
proprietor, one person. You're selling t-shirts, you're doing hair, whatever. You might be doing it under the table. You know, if you, if you get caught up in the system and you ain't got another way to do it, you might be a hand-to-hand -hand herb hustler. You can't own the dispensary because now they've decriminalized and in some places made weed legal. They're going to pay themselves to sell it to you. So you still out here hand-to-hand -hand herb hustling while the people who was buying from you yesterday are now selling to you because they got the money. Um, but at any rate, most of us are laboring class. Most of us are the people, so to speak. This is who Cabral was talking about in the context of Guinea in the bush, in the countryside. So to build institutions out of that requires being not only with those people, but being those people. What Ella Baker would say, the job of, a, or, of an organizer is to put herself out of a job. What Septon McClark would say is, yeah, you may not know how to read and write in English. I can teach you that, but you're going to teach me the true meaning of community. We're going to have an exchange on this. So let me let me bring you the skills that I went over there to get for this. But what I'm not going to get is what you had, which is the source. I'm returning to the source with the skills you sent me to get. Elaine Locke. Elaine Locke was an African from Philadelphia, born in 1884. Both of his parents, Mary and Pliny, were teachers. His father had a law degree from Howard, in fact, but couldn't really make a living as a lawyer, became a teacher. His mother, who he's very close to, um, you know, doted over him something. He graduated from Central High School, which is still there in Philly. Yeah, I know Central High. Uh, goes to Harvard University. Uh, gets a couple of degrees, in fact, becomes the first person of African descent to get a PhD in philosophy at Harvard. Spent some time overseas, University of Berlin, some other places, uh, Oxford University, where he uh, took a Rhodes Scholarship, was the first person of African descent to receive a Rhodes Scholarship with the blood of Cecil Rhodes dripping over that money. One of the most educated human beings in the world at the time that he received his PhD in the 20s. Takes a job at Howard University, 1912, I think it was, with the help of all people, Booker T. Washington, who was on the board of Howard at that time, I think. Locke is a brilliant brother. Locke's training is in philosophy, in literature. Locke is trying to work out a cultural theory. Yeah, it is uh, Milele, post-traumatic slave syndrome. And Mars talking about Maladoma, Maladoma Somme learned that after freeing himself from the clutches of Western religion, no question. And I'm glad y'all bring this up. People are responding that if you're on YouTube, we're in Nubia early and live. So the comments is, is, as Karen was saying, as Prof was saying, are very different than the ones on YouTube, as we understand YouTube being the kind of place where, you know, the, the laboring classes may have access a little bit more widely. But in Nubia, there's a very good conversation going on right now about the results of cultural imperialism and, and not returning to the source. That's where we get the kind of mentality that says that, yeah, I may have gone to HBCU, but I really aspire to be uh, uh, to be Harvard. In fact, there was a time when they called Howard the Black Harvard. In fact, some Negroes still do, but real quiet and never around me because I will clown the hell out of them. Sometimes they refer to it as the Black Oxford. You know, they, they like to be the Black something. Anytime you call something the Black something, what you're really saying is you worship your master. You worship your master. Don't add me on that. But anyway, the point is that Locke is grappling with this question of culture. As early as 1913, 14, and 15, uh, by 1914, he's on the faculty at Howard. He is 30 years old. And he gives a series of lectures that he's been trying to give for a few years. It's actually 1916, actually, 32. Uh, they've been collected by my brother Jeffrey Stewart in a, in a volume called Race, Context, and Interracial Relations. It's Elaine LeRoy Locke as a young man in his 30s. And, you know, I resisted the urge to trope all my Locke books because I wasn't going to do that. It, Jeff Stewart's big book, The uh, the New Negro. And by the way, uh, my friend, brother, Jegna Lucius T. Outlaw Jr. has a great review of Stewart's book in a recent issue of Boundary 2 which is a journal, but that's for the academics. And there's some academics in here that kind of over here from the place. We all got to commit class suicide, by the way, colleagues. Anyway, Locke is coming from one end of the class spectrum. By the time Locke makes transition in 1954 in New York City, he has spent 
his entire professional life trying to work out a theory of black culture that begins with a grounding in Africa. He's being fought by black people, even at Howard, people like James Porter, who eventually saw the light after Locke was gone. He's being fought over this notion that anything from Africa survived among African people in the diaspora, particularly in the United States. But Locke is very keen and clear about two things. Number one, he says, the African culture of the United States and states in its various manifestational, regional, local, however you want to look at it, is absolutely derived from an African foundation. And what you calling American culture is absolutely a commingling of those African cultures with whatever those Africans encountered over here. So when you see white people with no black people around and they doing something you call an American, you say, yes, yeah, I'm African in it. It's fascinating. I mean, he's got this theory of cultural pluralism and he's always talking about cultural context and when people meet. He says, but you cannot and should not try to assimilate, meaning lose your culture as you come into this space. That's why the conversation you were having prof around affirmative action too is very important. We're going to see that decision probably next week. And then we're going to have a different kind of conversation because, you know, affirmative action is gone. Okay, that's great. I don't care. I don't care because it don't affect me. And by that, I don't mean it doesn't affect me as an individual. It doesn't affect me in terms of the work I'm trying to contribute to. We need to build our institutions. And I'm not talking about HBCUs alone. In fact, I'm not talking about HBCUs primarily. Y'all know how we think about it. We jailbreak in the black university. We have jailbroken it. We're in a space now where everything they talking about in those spaces is here. The conversation you were having with the brother when you were like, you know, I majored in literature because I knew I was going to college. My parents said I'm going to college, but you know, maybe I shouldn't have. No, no, no. You needed to. Somebody got to ground themselves in cultural meaning making, in movement and memory. Somebody's got to ground themselves in ways of knowing. Everything can't be science and technology. They all work together for governance. And so rather than have people perhaps spend all that money or go into all that debt for college, guess what? We got a space now where you can get the momentum of memory and begin to contribute to it and grow it and expand it yourself without spending $50,000 or $15,000 or $100,000 without coming out of college with a debt of a quarter million dollars or $500,000. Come on in here. Come on in here. The small subscription fee in, in narrative. Come on in, newbie. We have the lessons. We got the conversations, people doing it. We are going to jailbreak that in the spirit of and in the practice of Amakar Cabral returning to the source and class suicide. Nobody's lording it over anybody here, which is now going to bring me to the other end of the spectrum which is where I want to spend the, the last few minutes this morning. Got the news a few days ago that my man made transition. Charles Leroy Bloxham. Charles Bloxham made transition at his house in the Philadelphia suburbs in Gwinnett. Pennsylvania on the 14th of June. I've got a few people other than my biological father who have been fathers to me for various and different reasons. Nate Norman down at Morehouse now. Jake Carruthers, DeFalo Binga. You know, um, there's so many, there, there are a handful of others Kamal Juwanza, I started naming them. I'm going to leave somebody out. And I don't, don't want to do that. Holly Garima. But Jeremiah Wright. Before I forget, because Jeremiah Wright sent me on a mission to take his greetings and love and a message to Sister Hazel Robinson, if you're in the D.C. area, at 4 o'clock today at Shallow Baptist Church. Dr. Wallace Charles Smith, pastor. This is Dr. Right, Reverend Wright, who's probably here this morning, said, you know, give the greetings to that brother, too, and pass my message. They're gonna, this is going to be the memorial service, the D.C. memorial service for Randall Robinson is today, 4 p.m. at Shiloh. I'm not sure if they're streaming it, since everything seems to be streamed these days. If you go on Shiloh Baptist Church, which is like in the same block as Carl G. Woodson's house on 9th Street over there in uh, northwest D.C., um, that's going to be at 4 o'clock. But at any rate, the, you know, Jeremiah Wright is one of those people 
for me, Baba J. Charles Bloxon did as much to shape me as anybody else. He's on the other end of the class spectrum than Elaine Locke. Charles Bloxon was born in Norristown, Pennsylvania, 1933, December 1933. From the time he was 14 years old, Charles Bloxon, who was known in college at Penn State as the Blockbuster, he was a track and field athlete, football man, played with Lenny Moore, track man, national shot put champion. He was known as the Blockbuster. We used to kid him. He said, Mr. Bloxon, you could probably put on a football uniform right now and run over people. Mr. Bloxon made transition on the 14th of June at 89 years old. Uh, didn't quite make his father's age. His father made transition in 97, Charles Edward Bloxon. It was in 2014, 2015, 2016, fairly recently. Um, his mother made transition back in the early arts. But Mr. Bloxon, was the greatest book collector of his generation. I was collecting books before I met Charles Bloxon. But Charles Bloxon, Charles Bloxon showed me how to do it in ways I continue to do it. And he poured into me because we had the same spirit. Charles Bloxon of course, like so many others, I don't know how he does it, but he does it. Uh, Charles Bloxon was interviewed 20 years ago by, you already know, Baba Larry Crow, another father, almost like a big brother kind of me, Crow. But Charles Bloxon was interviewed for the History Makers by Larry Crow. And, you know, there are moments that you I didn't know this, but the first time I watched his interview near the end, he talked about his protégés and he named me as one of his protégés and who's following in the tradition. And I'm absolutely doing that. I really don't, I don't really put a whole lot of stock in what people say about themselves. It's like what other people say about you. And for me, anytime somebody says something about me like that, that's not a compliment. That's an instruction to earn it. And he asked uh, Larry asked Mr. Bloxon what he asks everybody near the end of the interview. How would you like to be remembered? Charles Bloxon said, well, that's a hard question, but if I want to be remembered, I want to be remembered as a seeker, a finder, and a giver. A seeker, a finder, and a giver. And that's true. He said, what did I give? What did I give back? I gave to us the knowledge of our people. Because Larry asked him, you know, what did it mean to learn your history, to recover your history? He says, not our history. <laughs> Mr. Bloxon, correct him real quick. He said, brother Larry, it's not, it's not my history. It's our history. This is the momentum of memory. That's what we're doing right here. So while Elaine Locke fought that intellectual warfare around the question of culture in the most rarefied air of the European social structure, Harvard and Oxford and Berlin, you know, publishing that special issue survey graphic in 1925 that he then developed into a huge anthology called The New Negro, which is why they call Elaine Locke the father, so to speak, of the Harlem Renaissance. When he was teaching at Howard, noticing the gifts of a young lady from Florida named Zora Hurston, which is how she gets in the anthology, com uh, battling with, arguing with, but also colluding with uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, Arturo Schomburg in the American Negro Academy. Elaine Locke, as he is on the faculty at Howard with Eric Williams, with Ralph Bunch, with Abram Harris, with E. Franklin Frazier, and as he is being critiqued by some of these younger guys like Bunch and Frazier by saying, you're too much about culture and race. You need to be about class. This is about class. And, 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 and Locke, particularly early in his career, saying, yeah, there are social forces that we must combat, imperialism and global terror and all that. But while we're doing that, we have to understand that we can use culture as a weapon and we should use it as a weapon. Elaine Locke, who understands the significance of African memory all the way back, which is why when they unveiled or entered the tomb of Tutankhamun, the living reflection of Amun, the one that people erroneously call King Tut, the place we'll be visiting 
um, in a few weeks when we go to the Nile Valley in August. Elaine Lott was there. In the pages of the Crisis and other magazines, they raised money, just like the global majority is for us by us, and those and those and those dollars that revenue goes in institution building for us. Elaine Locke is like Black America need to be there when they open this tomb. So what did Black America did? They raised money and they sent Elaine Locke as Black America's representative, Negro America's representative, to the unveiling of, of the tomb of Tutankhamun. I think about it every time I go down in that tomb. So Elaine Locke was here, this little fella from Philly. And uh, it breaks my heart. When we were in Philadelphia a couple of weeks ago, we went through West Philadelphia, Elaine Locke School for years in elementary school, then middle school was K-8. Uh, it's still right there in, in, in West Philly, maybe about a quarter mile from where I lived for 17 years, but it's closed. Elaine Locke School. Broke my heart when we went by there. I said, let's go by and see Elaine Lock School. Damn. But at any rate, I'm saying I to say that while Elaine Lock was fighting that fight in the most reserved for whites areas of intellectual warfare and interfacing with debating, agreeing, disagreeing with people like Melba Herskovitz and France Boas, and, and then ultimately uh, passing the baton to take the parlance from another piece in the global majority collection, passing the baton to youngsters like one of his junior protégés, she and her husband and family took care of him when he was in DC as he got ill in the fifties. Margaret Just Butcher, one of the books I did bring is a little book, I brought my paperback version, I didn't bring the hardback call, The Negro in American Culture. This is the last book that Locke did, but, it, but it's got Margaret Just Butcher's name on it because Margaret Just Butcher, who was the daughter of Ernest Everett Just, in fact, let me just let her tell you all her relationship to Elaine Locke. I'm gonna read this sentence right quick. I'm gonna do it in the chapel in a few minutes when I go over to, to give a few remarks on Locke before we tour and then go to his grave site when I'm gonna tell the story of how I was at Elaine Locke's funeral. Morgan Just Busher says, I first saw Elaine Locke in December, 1919. I was a girl of six. He and my father, the late Ernest Just, the great scientist from South Carolina, Dartmouth College. We're standing at the door, I'm sorry, professor of zoology, now biology, at Howard University. I was a girl of six. He and my father, the late Ernest Just, were standing at the door of the auditorium of the old minor normal school, where I was a first grade pupil in the practice school. That building is still there, by the way. I remember looking expectantly at each. I had just recited the night before Christmas and was ready to be complimented. My father, Ernest Just said dryly, you forgot a line. Elaine Locke, or Alan, it's pronounced. Alan Locke said kindly after glaring at my father, quote, you did very well, end quote. I last saw Elaine at, in May, 1954. This is Brown versus Board of Education, May 54, right? Mark Just Butcher said, I last saw him in May 1954. He was at Mount Sinai Hospital, New York, desperately ill, yet still able to be his old kind self. This time he was concerned that for the second time I had come to New York from Washington to see him in spite of the fact that I was on crutches as a result of an injury. He was unusually susceptible to sentiment that day and smiled when I told him I had come, I had to come because it was Mother's Day and I was standing in loco parentis. Meaning what? I'm standing in for your mother, who's an ancestor now, Mary. She finished his last book from his notes, The Negro in American Culture. This is the table of contents. The Negro's role in American society, the Negro in American culture, the early folk gifts, music, dance, folklore, Negro music and dance, formal recognition and reconstruction, Negro folk poetry and folklore formal Negro poetry, the fiction and polemics of the anti-slavery period, the Negro and the modern American fiction, the Negro and American drama, the Negro and American art, regional nationalism in American culture, some prospects of American culture. She finished the book from his notes, but it's very important as because we, when we do not remember, when we don't return to the source, when we don't gain the momentum of memory, we think every new book come out the first time somebody talked about that. And that is the mark of a group of people who are really functioning as a race of children. A race of children. 
Shakespeare, Chaucer, the Greeks, the Romans, Christopher Marlowe, Whitman, James Fenimore Cooper, Louisa May Alcott. And what did you do, Nick Rowe? Uh, Ralph Ellison, Tony Morrison, uh, <laughs> uh, anti-racism, uh, critical race theory, uh, 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 Elaine Locke been banging on this since these lectures he gave on the campus of Howard University in 1916 and drawing on a momentum that predates that. Now that's on that end. Now let me get to where I really want to go to for a couple of minutes before I go over here to the chapel. Well, I might as well finish on the story of I was at Elaine Locke's funeral. I'm gonna talk more about this when we're at the grave site in a minute. Elaine Locke is buried right next to Warren Robbins, who was the creator of the National Museum of African Art, now the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, which began life after his house at the home of Frederick Douglass, his house on Capitol Hill. And then now, of course, is on the National Mall and the Smithsonian uh, family of museums. By the way, Lonnie Bunch sent a message out because Mr. Bloxon had a great number of items from Harriet Tubman entrusted to him by her family, to her descendants. And Bloxon turned those materials over, including Harriet Tubman's Bible, her prayer shawl, to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So when you go to Namak, when you go to the National Museum of African American History and Culture in the basement floor and you see Harriet Tubman's items, you have Charles Bloxon to thank for that. Mr. Bloxon had them in Philly for many, many years. He was an expert. One of the 13 books he wrote, several of the 13 books he wrote, were on the Underground Railroad. Um, and he was the first person of African descent to write a cover feature article in National Geographic. He did it on the Underground Railroad. Then he wrote another one on Gullah Geechee culture. Charles Bloxon, who came out of the public schools in Norristown, Pennsylvania. Charles Bloxon, who went to Penn State as an athlete but left before he got his degree, who was valued as an alum, who after he donated some 20,000 items, now grown to 700,000 items plus the Temple University for the Charles L. Bloxon collection where I worked, coming to that story. He donated another collection to Penn State University. So there's a Bloxon collection at Penn State University. The first time I went out there, I'm like, Mr. Bloxon, man, I called him, Mr. Bloxon, what'd you say, man? Like he trained me. He said, I hate to go in the store and see some books about us and leave them in there. So he, he built what he called a duplicate collection. He always building duplicates, <laughs> building duplicate collections. I have a number of books that he gave me out of his duplicate connections. He came to my apartment in Philly, stuffed with books, like what you see now in Silver Springs, although most of my stuff is in storage, that stuff. And he came, we, we sitting in there talking. He said, let me look, let me look. So yeah, this man, Charlie Bloxon, 1933, so 43, 53, 63, 73, 83, 93. So he's in his 60s, early 60s. He's on his hands and knees in my apartment, crawling around looking at the bottom of the bookshelves. <laughs> then we would go to his house, very modest. Warren Buffett lived modestly, Charles Blossom lived modestly, but Charles Blossom wasn't a billionaire. He spent his money on books. We get in the car, he said, come on, let's go. We go book hunting. Charles Blossom knew all the book people and all the book people knew him. I'm talking about the auction houses, why day and them boys, our swan gallery, all them. But I'm talking about just regular, I'm talking about rank and file. I'm talking about people with the book style down there off Market Street at Reading Terminal where they sell everything. And I'm talking about the Goodwill. I'm talking, it was, it was a book to be had. Charles Bloxham was there. So at any rate, man, let me finish with, with the lane lock and I'll come back to Bloxham. So being out here and you know, Elaine Locke's ashes were interred here. He's buried next to Warren Robbins, as I said, who was the founder of the National Museum of African Art, white dude. And earlier today, talking to Sarah, who's one of the uh, folk who, who managed the cemetery, overlooked the cemetery, she said she worked for Warren Robbins. I was like, really? You work for Mr. Robbins? Interesting. I never met him. He made transition in 2008 and was buried before Elaine Locke, which is where I'm going. Elaine Locke, when he died, he was cremated, his wishes. 
and his ashes were given to his friend, Arthur Huff Fawcett. You probably know the Fawcett family, Jesse Fawcett, Arthur Huff Fawcett, Crystal Burr Fawcett, the Fawcett's of Philadelphia, legislators, literature folk, Harlem Renaissance, New Negro, in terms of Jesse Fawcett, Arthur Huff Fawcett, historian, particularly of religion, uh, was it Black Gods of the Metropolis or Negro Gods of the Metropolis, his most famous book. But at any rate, and that was it. From 1954 until he made transition to 2014, when he was interred in this congressional cemetery, Elaine's lot, Elaine Locke was out of the ground. Because, you know, Jeffrey Stewart, who wrote the book on Elaine, one of the books on Elaine Locke, The New Negro, about a thousand page book, came out a few years ago, 2018, I think, won the National Book Award and many other awards. Jeff Stewart claims that perhaps Locke never wanted to be buried. Maybe that was the case, but either way, and I won't go through the story of how Locke's ashes ended up here, except to say that they were in Philadelphia for years. They were entrusted to J. Weldon Norris, who was on the faculty of Howard, and um, Professor Norris, who was the director of Howard University Choirs and Music for many years from South Carolina, visiting friends in Philadelphia, the family. They said, hey, we, we got to lay Locke here. Why don't you, could you? He takes Locke's ashes back to Howard, and then the debate begins, not quite after the ashes come because he Locke's ashes were in the archive, the Moreland Spingarn research collection for a number of years. And then people realize, hey, these are human remains. They shouldn't just be in a in a library archive. So they take them over to my friend and brother, the great Mark Edward Mack, who is now an ancestor, my colleague Mark Mack, who worked on the New York African burial ground. I told you about Mark Mack when we were up there at the burial ground. See now, COVID's opening up, we on the road. You go back to the archive, you can stitch all this stuff, again, stitch all this stuff together. One of our great master teachers, the great Mark Mack, my generation, our generation. Mack, anthropologist Mack, the Monty Cobb lab, which is, is set up for human remains to receive human remains. That's where the New York African burial ground bones were before they were reinterred. They were the custodians of Elaine Locke's ashes. Until Mark made transition, my sister and dear friend, Fatima Jackson, uh, came up from North Carolina to take over the Cobb lab. They were in her custody. And then the debate began what to do. Maybe we, you see him? Oh, got it. Can you? Oh, you? Okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. So, the, so to ask, do you inter him on campus? And, you know, folk, trustees, whatever, they, they no, we don't have a tradition of uh, interring people on Howard's campus. No problem. Temple, Russell Conwell, President of Temple, he's buried there, he and his wife. Booker T. Washington buried in Tuskegee. Uh, J.C. Price is at Livingstone. Well, I understand Howard don't do that. No problem. Because they were thinking maybe make a glass brick and put him in Lock Hall in, 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 the, in the building that bears his name. Nah, that's too much. No problem. So the Rhodes Scholars get together. And I'll keep this story short. I think I've told it before. I'm going to keep it short today because I want to go back to Mr. Bloxham because that's really who I want to talk about for a couple of minutes today before we go to this ritual. Elaine Locke's ashes are here because the Black Rhodes Scholars, Black people who received a Rhodes Scholarship, put in money and bought a plot in a congressional cemetery. And the day of his funeral, which was September the 14th, if memory serves me correctly, 2014. We got up early. Dr. Watkins, Dr. Beatty, Dr. Dana Williams, myself, a few other of us. We got here early because we because they got the chapel here is small. We say ain't gonna be a whole lot of people. I mean, we think it's gonna be a whole lot of people because it's a lane lot. We got here, we were the first ones here. And then a van pulls up. Out of the van come all these young black people dressed in black with kente cloth stoles around their neck. Who are y'all? We drove from Massachusetts. Really? What part of Massachusetts? Cambridge. Cambridge? Yeah, we're from Harvard. What? Who are y'all? We the black choir from Harvard. <laughs> These children had come. I say children. They're undergraduate students. They came to sing at Elaine Locke's funeral. Now imagine this. This 2014. 60 years after Locke passed, you can tell your grandchildren you sang at Elaine Locke's funeral. Said, We're not going to miss this for nothing. So they came, and it was an incredible ritual. And then we went to the gravesite after the rituals. They put his urn in the ground, and they had the mound of dirt. And then each of us got to take 
the little spatula thing, the little the little silver uh, shovel, then the dirt and things. So I helped bury Elaine Locke, along with a whole lot of other people. But I'm saying I like to say that Locke represented intellectual warfare on that end of the class spectrum. He never committed class suicide. He liked nice stuff. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And he, but he fought on the grounds of culture, the battle ground of culture. And he believed in the culture of the laboring classes of our people. And he fought that. Let me go ahead, jump in. Just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, Alan, yeah, I guess they say, yeah. Come on. That's right. to go to Harvard, go to Oxford, become the first black Rhodes Scholar, go over to Germany, to Berlin, you know, which also W.B. Du Bois did as well. That's but you think, right. about, you think about, you know, because when we talk about blackness in the 1800s, we're always <laughs> talking about slavery. We're mm -hmm. really talking about the Locke family or even the Du Bois family, right? And so how should we be in, in, in community with him? And then what does it say? Because we were just talking about, you know, these institutions, you know, these, these venerable institutions. Why isn't he a household name? You know, you think about the accomplishments of a man born in 1885 to go to Harvard, Oxford, Berlin, then come back to Howard and teach literature, which I love. Um, come on now. And to be the first Rhodes Scholar ever, right? Black. To, yeah. what, what what does what, what does that mean? And then to be centered in blackness. So that's it. So how did he now? He wasn't trying to be white. He wasn't. He wasn't trying to really even be accepted by them. He came in and rocked. Maybe although, I don't know. Although he although he was very comfortable with them. The tensions for Locke were probably, you know, Stewart certainly says this. Although Outlaw in his review says that he probably overstates the case, but the tensions were around gender. Because mm. what did it mean to be a gay man? In, in the 1800s? I mean, you better talk yeah. about that. Yeah. Facts. Facts. You know, or, and again. Or, or, I mean, or, or, or Dr. Carr, I might posit this. I might posit that maybe, maybe it wasn't so unusual in white circles. Well, that's where it gets interesting because Jeff Stewart got him down to the, because Jeff Stewart used to work at Warren Spengar and he went through the archive and you see when he's in high school, when he's in, Yeah. It may not be, but also, and this is what Lucius Outlaw says, he says, you know, what we call queer now, the language, he says, don't make the mistake of back mapping that language to that period and assuming that black people were intolerant. Don't do that to black people. The Lou Outlaw is heavy on this. He said, don't, don't, don't do that to black people. No, whatever discomforts Locke had, some of them were self-imposed. He could be petty. He could be mean. He could be vindictive. Him and Zora Neale Hurston fell out about mule bone and this white woman giving him money. Talk about Godmother Osgood. We, we talked about when we read Barracoon in, in Nubia. But he said, don't underestimate our people's capacity to take you as you are. Mm -hmm. Some of Locke's problems were because of class. Theoretically, you get how lovely black people are. But as Sterling Brown, who was his colleague, said, and this is why Holly's film, we got to get Holly to show that film in Nubia. Sterling Brown after winter. Sterling Brown said, remember I talked about it, Sterling Brown said, uh, Elaine Locke was the kind that if the blues was playing outside his window, he would get up, walk to the window, close it, and go back and sit down. You know, I love the people, theoretically, but these loud Negroes on Saturday night in my alley here in D.C., I don't love the blues that much. Now, he gonna make an argument for the blues at the Library of Congress with Sterling Brown, but Sterling Brown was the one drinking with them Negroes. So, I mean, <laughs> class, I think class has a lot to do with, don't put all that on gender. In other words, yes, anyway. <laughs> so, and, and I, I just popped in because if we are to be in community, because part of this uh, thing that we're doing is for us to remember. That's right. And to reclaim the folk that other people don't sit with. If we're gonna be in community with Alan Locke, Yes. Where where do we start through his words? Because we like to sit with people in their own words. You held up a book. Mm -hmm. is, that where we, is that where we start, Dr. Carr? Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I always believe, like, like you said, we start with what they said. Alan Locke, let me see if I can find. The first speech he gives 
he gives this talk in 1916. It's called The Theoretical and Scientific Conceptions of Race. He's worried. He, he, he comes into Carnegie Library at Howard in 1916. It's a thunderstorm that day. All this is recorded. And he's worried people not coming. By the time he starts his lecture, everybody's there. Dean Kelly Miller, who came through slavery, was the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Howard. He says, ladies and gentlemen, Ever since the possibility of comparative study of races dawned upon me at the Racist Congress in London in 1911, I have had the courage of a very optimistic and steadfast belief that in the scientific approach to the race question, there was the possibility of redemption for those false attitudes of mind, which have unfortunately so complicated the idea and conception of race, that there are a great many people who fancy that the best thing that can possibly be done if possible at all, is to throw race out of the categories of human thinking. At the same time, even if it were possible to eliminate the concept that has been at the center of so much social thinking, let us not presume, at least at the outset of a study professing a critical basis, that it would be desirable. Therein lies the dilemma. He says race is a social construct. He's not saying it that way. We say it now like an article of faith. When Locke was bringing this up, this was the time people thought black people just biologically inferior. It's the shape of our head. It's it's our capacity. It's, it's our nostrils. I mean, all this old foolishness, this social Darwinist foolishness, that stuff that fed, fed eugenics. You know, look at their foreheads, look at their skin, look at their hair. Locke is like, this ain't got, I ain't got the rate. That's not real. He said, but I tell you, if you're gonna think about race, you should think about it in terms of culture. Now, we do come from various cultures that we then brought with us and then adapted to these spaces. What you're not going to do is start our history with slavery. And what you're not going to do is think that slavery was somehow the expression of inferior culture. Now, I'm all for universal humanity. I'm pushing it. He was a big component of that. When People's Meet, his last anthology that he published while he was alive, he's talking about this thing. Huge book. Anthology. But Locke is like, culture matters. And so we think about starting with his language. He's saying that as early as his early 30s when he is at Howard University in 1916. 31 years old, 32 years old, and they wouldn't let him teach the black stuff on the curriculum. They still had white presidents. He paused his time at Howard because the last white president was like, this guy got to go. It took Mordecai Johnson coming to get him back. And so... Locke was way ahead of his time on race thinking because he's trying to move away from biology and thinking about the social scientific basis of race and critiquing white supremacy, which was not a non which was a non-starter too. In fact, it was such a non-starter that that uh, Stewart argues that Locke spent most of the rest of his career not really engaged in a social science critique of whiteness, a social science critique of imperialism, but rather continuing to build out this theory of the cultural foundations of identity, which could then become a launching pad for social transformation. So he's an important, now how do we not know about him? Very easy. It's the shadow ban we've been talking about. People talking about banning books and say, what about them books you got on your shelf that you never read? That's the shadow ban. I'm much more concerned about the shadow ban. Much more concerned about the shadow ban. So, and we, we should spend some more time with Locke. We could probably pick some things with Locke to read. Locke, Locke can be very dense and theoretical. Again, he was trained in philosophy. And he's a cold-blooded philosopher. But what he doesn't have at the time he was working through his theories is a lot of companions. He meets some continental Africans when he's in school at Oxford. He's traveling. Like I said, he traveled through the world. So he he spent time with a lot of different kind of people. And, and very importantly, this is important to black institutions. Uh, by the way, shout out to my friend and now colleague at the Howard Law School, um, Sherilyn Eiffel, uh, who has just been appointed to Howard Law School. So... You know, what, what What was it the HBCUs at that time, not just Howard, but all the HBCUs, was because of the sequel to slavery, as Carl G. Wilson would call it, Jim Crow, the black scholars were at the black schools and they had, and the black students had access to them. I'll tell you there's an interesting story very quickly. Ozzie Davis tells a story about Alan Locke. Alan Locke. Ozzie Davis came up from Georgia, way across Georgia, and he's taking classes and he took a class with Dr. Locke. And he said, I'm, I'm sitting in the class with Alan Locke, you know, as Davis be talking, he said, uh, Locke invited me to his office. And he said, Mr. Davis, what do you want to do? And I told him, I want to be a playwright. 
He looked at me. He said, playwright. I said, yes, sir. He said, okay. Well, have you ever seen a play? And I said, well, I, I've been to the, the movies, the motion pictures. He said, no, 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 no. Have you ever seen the theater? He said, well, we had gone to vaudeville. And he said, you've never seen the theater. I said, well, well no. He said, where are you from? Uh, way, way across Georgia. Hmm. He said, Mr. Lott, Dr. Lott looked at me and said, I want you to go to New York, go to Harlem. He named the name of the theater company, told Ozzie Davis, when you get there, you tell them I sent you and see if they will have you. And if they will hire you, you do everything in that Negro theater. You paint scenery, you move furniture, you act, you direct, you sing, and then you will have some sense of whether or not you want to do that. As David said, it took me a little while to get there, but I got there to New York. I got there to Harlem. I got to the theater company. I told them that the lock sent me. They brought me on. And I've been in the theater ever since. See, that's what happens in a black space. He said Dr. Locke was a magnificent man. He was a beautiful spirit. Elaine Locke, one of the most trained academically human beings on the planet at the time, R.C. Davis, Ozzie Davis, out of Waycross, Georgia, ain't never been to the theater. You talking about the movies? And I'm like, well, you won't be a playwright? You don't even, boy. <laughs> See, that is a version of class suicide in a sense. Because Ozzie Davis and Ruby D cut that swath. They joined that baton. That battalion, that battalion, they take that baton, they join that battalion of people who are actually making theater, making art that is from the people for the people. Now, we don't know that because we institutionally have turned over our memory to people who profit from it. And we don't know it because as we're doing in spaces like this, we don't have enough spaces where we just throw it open and say, everybody come, let's sit in this, let's sit with this. And then you go and take it and do what you want, whatever your direction you need to take it. But it's very important as a point of entry to have a space where this is introduced because there's somebody in here, there's more than a few somebody's in here who having heard now for the first time something more than the name Alan Locke, a-L-A-I-N, Alan Locke, or someone who didn't even hear that name before, Locke, L-O-C-K-E, is now said, I'm going to go look him up. And that's going to lead you to Arturo Schomburg. That's going to lead you to County Cullen. That's going to lead you to Zorno Hurston. That's going to lead you to a full tapestry. But if Alan Locke's name is not known, what about Charles LeVoy Locke's and this is where I'm going to end because the this, the the, the uh, program starts at 1030. And I want to pick some of this up maybe next week because I, I tell you that awful day will surely come for all of us. And we will, you know, go back where we came from, wherever that is. But I tell you, when we lose in that moment, you know how the, the saying goes, when an elder dies, it's like a library has burned. In Charles Bloxon's case, that is not the case because Charlie Bloxon, who told Larry Crow that I only be remembered as a seeker, a finder, and a giver. That's, he literally did that. So I'll tell y'all very quickly, just a quick thumbnail. I first learned about Charles Bloxon in this book. This is called Black Bibliophiles and Collectors. That's Jesse Moreland, who gave his books to Howard University, the Moreland Collection. But look at this. You see who edited that? Eleanor de Verney Sinet, uh, who's an ancestor now. Uh, her husband, Calvin Sinet, we talked about black golfers. He, he wrote the book on black golfers. Uh, William Paul Coates, look at that. Paul Coates was working at Moreland Spangorn at the time, and Thomas Battle, who's the director of the Moreland Spangorn. This book came out in 1990. I had just graduated law school. And I went into a bookstore. This is like maybe around December 90. And just buying books. That's what I did. Uh, that's around the time I got Black History and Historical Profession, um, which we've talked about before. Very important book. Kind of gives you 
Well, anyway, I'm going to get into that. But I bought this book. Not this copy, but this book. Howard University Press, Washington, D.C., 1990. And I started reading it because I was a book collector. You know, I started collecting books when I was an undergrad and I had a nice little collection. You know, a couple of bookshelves by the time I graduated from law school. And I had gone to New York, as I said, in 1989 when I clerked for the LBCP Legal Defense Fund, which is where I first met a young junior attorney on staff named Sherilyn Eiffel. As a reminder, we were exchanging messages after I heard she got hired last week. Dorothy Porter Wesley has a piece in here. Tony Martin, my friend Tony Martin, the great historian, Garvey historian. Uh, Eleanor Sinet, of course, Bobby Hill, Robert Hill. Jesse Carney Smith, who was at Fisk University, the great sister uh, director and curator at the Fisk Libraries, the John and Aurelia Hope Franklin Library at Fisk University, the great Jean Blackwell Hitson, who I never got a chance to meet. The only time I met Dorothy Porter Wesley was with Mr. Blossom. We drove from Philly to DC for an Asala luncheon, Association of the Study of Negro Life and History. He wanted me to come with him so he could introduce me to Dorothy Porter Wesley. And I tell you, she considered him the second coming of Schomburg. Schomburg, Dwayne Porter Wesley, Charlie Bloxon, and Bloxon standing there. We in the luncheon. He said, I want you to meet. He's the next one. See, I'm going to tell y'all about me when it comes to all these bourgeois, pretentious Negroes. I'm going to guess all y'all. Because Charlie Bloxon is my man. The most unpretentious the most, Charlie, when I tell you, hmm, let me, mm -mm. see, he's an ancestor now. So some of these stories I'm going to tell, because you only going to tell to the person's an ancestor. Some of you Negroes need to be shaking in your boots. Some of y'all kind of know who you are. Mr. Bloxon did not suffer bourgeois pretension. Ooh. Minnie Clayton, Betty Cole, proper. But anyway, there was a small section in here, part four, called Bibliophiles and Collectors Roundtables, because these people are librarians, they deal with books, but then here go the book collectors. See, book collectors often get a short shrift if they're not trained. I almost slapped the mess out of an academic who shall remain nameless because he's still alive, who had the nerve to tell me one time, maybe 30 years ago almost. Well, I mean, after all, Charles Bloxon doesn't have a college degree. Hmm. And you've got four. And yet you'll soon be in the ground. So how good will they do? Anyway, you gonna stop talking about Miss Black, especially since you sneak over to the collection to get his books. Anyway, uh, the two people who talked, whose essays were included in here, Charles Bloxon and Clarence Hope, and then Paul Robeson Jr. is in here, Karen Jefferson, my friend Karen Jefferson, who left one spring on, went down to Atlanta University. James Turner wrote the closing uh, summary, and then Michael Winston, of course, wrote the remarks. He was the first director of Morgan Spengarn. But I read Charles Bloxon's essay. Black Giants in Bindings. Let me just turn to that right quick. Charlie Bloxon said, I collect these books because we got to read. He says, I consider book collecting one aid in the development of pride and self-respect. And I consider book collecting one aid to understanding, which is, after all, a prerequisite to self-respect. You got to study to see the momentum. Anyway, I read this in Hall of 1990, December 1990. I came to Temple in 1992. This was part of my process of moving from law to graduate study. When I came to Temple, sitting there, I have full scholarships. I'm not paying for anything. All I got to do is go to class and read. I'm in heaven. And they give me a stipend, which means rent, light bill, and books. Food, maybe later. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. I said, I'm going to the Bloxon collection. Am I going to meet Mr. Bloxon? Hmm. No. Mm, I would love to meet him, but I ain't going to just bust. I'm not wanting people to bust up in people's faces. So I'm just going to sit in the reading room and the uh, librarian there, uh, my dear friend and sister, Aslaku Bahanu, um, who ended up working with Ethiopian sister. Aslaku was behind the counter at the Blackson Collection. There's this big collection of books behind the counter. And you had to get up, go up there and ask for a book. You had to know what you were looking for. They had to look at the card catalog and then she would get the book, bring it to you. And then they had a reading room, some tables. So I'm sitting there. I would go over there every day just to work, just to read, take notes, to write. I'm sitting there. So one day I'm sitting in there after maybe, I don't know, about a month. And 
there's a bust of Mr. Bloxham, like a bronze bust sitting against the back wall, which is full of books. I'm reading. The bust was made by Anthony Salemi, who died at 102 years old. Salemi is the one who sculpted Paul Robeson, the nude of Paul Robeson that was lost in the 40s. Uh, and Salemi befriended Mr. Bloxham. This box is about 6'3", kind of chocolate-colored brother. In fact, let me, I'll show you his picture in a minute. Charles Bloxham, Salemi said, you remind me of Paul Robeson. And Paul Robeson was Mr. Bloxham's hero. Uh, the copy that I have of Paul Robeson's sister, Marion's uh, small book on the last years of Paul Robeson's life that he spent at her house in West Philadelphia, uh, the copy I have, the signed copy I have, Charles Bloxham gave me that because he would go over there to what is now the Paul Robeson house. He didn't want to bother Mr. Robeson, but he would go over there sometime. And one time they let him come in and Mr. Robeson signed books for him. It's a beautiful thing. Paul Robeson was his hero. And he kind of looked like Paul Robeson. And so let me sculpt it, a bust of <laughs> Mr. Bloxham after, after Bloxham posed for a for Salemi to make a replica of the full life-size figure, the nude figure of Robeson that he crafted, sculpted, and then displayed in Rittenhouse Square in uh, Philadelphia. And then the city father said, you got to take that off. Why? Because our wives are going down there looking at this naked black man. And he was causing problems at home. Anyway, Bloxham, we used to crack up when he tells that story. Anyway, so point is, I'm sitting there reading Busted Open. And then the swinging doors, the big, heavy oak doors, the enter into collection, just bust open. Boom. It's Charles Bloxham. The blockbuster busting in. Let's go. Well, uh, uh, I need uh, Hubert Henry Harrison. Oh, which, which, he's, he's trying to remember the book. So I'm sitting there, second to two pass. Oh, which one? It's Laku is a librarian. She's not a book collector. She's learned the books, but a librarian may not know the books. Book collectors know books differently than librarians. Okay. She said, the title was the title, Mr. Bloxham. Oh, uh, it's a. Uh, and I said, now I say, is it the Negro in the Nation or When Africa Awakes? He looks at me. What you know about Hubert Harris? See, this is how book collectors talk to each other. If somebody named an obscure book and somebody else give you the author or the date or where it was published, with, that's when we find each other. He said, what you know about Hubert Harris? I said, I know those are the only two volumes that he ever published that were collected, right? He said, that's right. I need one after a week. That's right. He said, what you know about that? I said, well, I don't have copies. I said, I don't have copies of when they were published, but I have photocopies that were bound and I bought them from Professor Hunter. As I told Mr. Bloxon that day, it was around 1993. I said, uh, I've been 92. I said, I bought them from E. Curtis Alexander. <laughs> Kwame's dad. <laughs> because Curtis Alexander had all the old books that were out of print, but he would get them, create new editions, buy them, and sell them. So I bought them books in Columbus out of my little, my little stipend. Rent, light bill. All right, let's get the rest of the old books. Anyway. Long story short, Mr. Bloxer said, come with me. He gets the book. I follow him around to the other side of the hall. We go into his office where he's got the busts of Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and Henri Christophe from Haiti since he's been a lot of time in Haiti. When he's got, and I'm going to pick this up next week, because I'm going to but this is so important to me because this man really, a lot of what we talk about now, a lot of what we do now, Bloxer said, I kind of developed a photographic memory around books. If you are a book collector, that's how you remember books. I have a lot of friends. We all, we both do. We have a lot of colleagues and great people who are academics. But if you ask them something outside of their thing they're studying, they're not necessarily so a book collector. Bloxham was like, collect it all. Collect it all. Mr. Bloxham, and he said, I collect, I was collecting stuff. In fact, I'll tell you very quickly a little story that's in this essay that I then, you know, heard from him mouth to ear as we sat and talked about books. He talked about the highs and lows of book buying, right? And he said, uh, he talks, let me see if I can find it quickly. Um, yeah, 
he talks about losing books. He talks about, um, he talks about leaving a copy of James Pennington's, in fact, let me just read this because this one will break your heart. He knew Louis Michaud, by the way, him and Mr. Michaud. He would go up there, that's when he met Malcolm X, Mr. Bloxham, in Mr. Michaud's bookstore, Richard B. Moore, he knew all them people. He said, the years have not been without their disappointment. I mean, in the way of book collecting. For instance, in 1969, when I went to New York City's Metropolitan Museum to browse, I became sidetracked, as is my want, to the university bookstore owned by Walter Gold Goldwater, a dealer who has specialized in black literature for more than 30 years. He is an interesting conversationalist, having known all the famous black book collectors. I purchased a few books from him that day. One was The Fugitive Blacksmith, or Events in the History of J.W.C. Pennington, a slave narrative. I, I eventually used Pennington in my dissertation, by the way. Then he says he got on a train going back to Philly, and then he was so engrossed in reading the book that he almost missed his stop. So he put the book on the seat to grab his bags and he rushed off the train and he got off the train and realized he had left the book. He'd never forget. He said, I purchased my copy for $4. I have seen it catalog recently at $45. I've only seen two other copies of the book at the library company and at Howard University. Let me tell you right now, you can't buy a copy of The Fugitive Blacksmith today because as he talks about, now it's popular. You could not build Bloxham's collection today. You couldn't build my collection today, frankly. Although mine is a shadow of his, it's still in the period before the thing got so hot. And I know how to hunt a book. There's no place you don't go to hunt a book. But I said all that. Let me kind of wind this up. Charles Bloxon, I'm going to pick up with this next week because there's so much more to say about him. I haven't really said much about him at all. This is a little something called, I'll just grab a few of my books. This is the Pennsylvania Historical State Markers pamphlet published by the Bloxon Collection and the William Penn Foundation. Mr. Bloxon led the commission that put up the historical markers in the city of Philadelphia. Um, this is the page for Alan Locke, right? Um, Francis Frank Johnson, Henry Phillips, Gertrude Mossel. You're talking about Meta Fuller, Father Divine. When you see those historical markers anywhere around the country, Philadelphia has the most, Pennsylvania has the most, and Bloxon was the head of the commission. They brought him in to advise on the Underground Railroad Museum in, in Cincinnati. He's all through the country, and he's saying, you got to put these memorials, public history. Coco um, Kalita Nichols Fairfax, who's on faculty at Norfolk State, one of my colleagues from, uh, from Temple, she talks about studying with Mr. Bloxon. She's on the Historical Commission in, in Virginia. His thing was, it ain't enough to write books. I wrote 13, including Black genealogy. He wrote the first book on African-American genealogy. He traced his own family and then said, now I'm going to show everybody else how to do it. So all this genealogy stuff, his friend Alex Haley, for example, he was good friends with Alex Haley, all that, Charlie Bloxon was the one. Oh, he doesn't have a degree. Now, Charlie Bloxon got the books and he got passion and you about to get the slapped out of you. You need to shut up or go back over there with your master since you think the paper you got is some substitute for the com for the committed life of gathering materials. Anyway, Charles Bloxon, when you go, remember when we was in Philadelphia, it's talking about the president's house and all that. This is one of his last books, The President's House Revisited, Behind the Scenes, the Samuel Francis story, Charles L. Bloxon. Bloxon was on the commission that got the president's house done in Philadelphia. My friend Michael Cord, attorney Michael Cord, and the Avenging the Ancestors Coalition talks about that war that was fought in Philadelphia. We were all there battling at the same time. Charlie Bloxham was on the other side with the Park Service and all them telling them, y'all gonna tell the story right. You talking about George Washington, don't give a damn about that. You gonna talk about on a judge, you gonna talk about uh, Hercules. I'm not talking about now that it's popular and books are coming out and people going by, that's important. But you stand on the shoulders, on the foundation of true warfare by Charles Bloxon and those people, people whose names are not known. And then finally, I'll end with this for now today. We'll pick this up. One day I'm in there. So now I'm over to Bloxon every day. Me and him thick as thieves. He telling me stories. He went in there every once in a while. His friends would come in or they would call. He's very good friends with Barbara Chase Rabo. She would call, he put me on the phone. Oh, hey, how you doing? Uh, Lenny Moore's old buddy who played in the NFL. Lenny Moore would call Mr. Black and Mr. Bloxon, oh my God. He, if a pretentious Negro would call there looking for a book or looking for, oh, yes, we're from such and such. And we understand you have a copy. I mean, he got everything. Phyllis Wheatley's poems, everything. I mean, he has so many. The Prince Saunders, the Haitian papers. I can't even name it. If you can think about it, maps, ephemera. Photographs, the whole collection of John Mosley, you know, I mean, the, the great photographer. When when I graduated from Temple in 1998, my parents came up with family. We went over there and he gave them signed copies of his book. He gave my mother signed copies of the John Mosley book. I mean, me and Mr. Blackman was thick as thieves. We leave out, start hunting for books. 
going places. We come in, he come to my place, I go over his house. Anyway, Bloxon, one day, he's saying, you know, I think I'm going to write my life story. Yeah, Mr. Block, good, because you don't wrote about everybody else and everything else. You need to write about yourself. And I'm hyping him because I'm like, yeah, man, you need to tell that story, man, because there's nobody like, and everybody, Glenn Carrington, I'm talking about all the great book collectors who come before him, William Dorsey and the boys from the 19th century. These are people Elaine Locke knew and respected. They respected Schomburg and the American Negro Academy. Schomburg didn't go to school, but Schomburg had all the books, which I'm not going to do is, is clown me. And when you look at how Elaine Locke talked about Schomburg, there was a lot of respect, but he also said, well, he didn't go to school. Yeah, he didn't go to school, but every book you writing from, he got over there on 105th Street. Don't play. Don't play. Don't play, Alan. We know you Oxford, we know you Harvard, we know he Puerto Rican, we know he from the mail room, yeah, we know he worked in the bank, and every dime he got, he bought on books, and you over his place, he ain't coming over your house. So let's be clear about the role of book collectors. Bloxon knew them all. Not those guys who were before him, but his contemporaries and the elders who were alive, like Mr. Michaud, he would hang out there, and all them people, Richard B. Moore and all them, and then all of his contemporaries, Clarence Hope, uh, the great Lawrence D. Reddick, I mean, who was on faculty at Temple after he came, he was the Schomburg to artist. Anyway, so he said, oh, I'm gonna tell my life story. So, okay, how can I help? He looked at me and he, looked, he smiled and he kind of licked his lips. Well, maybe you could ask me some questions to get me started. It's okay. So I grabbed some notebook paper. This is the same ritual I did with Obinga. Grab some notebook paper. No, grab typing paper, not even notebook paper, not with no lines. So tell me, Mr. Blas, when do you start collecting? So we're going to start with my family, with my parents. His father, who collected black newspapers, his daddy did what adults do, bring the newspaper home, all the black newspapers, Philadelphia Inquirer, Norfolk Journal and Guide, Amsterdam News. He's reading them as a child. I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing. We may talk for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, two hours. I finish, he say, Look, there's no need. All right. I will go home, type up, bring back the pages. He would edit. I got to be his stenographer. In 1998, this book came out, Damn Rare, The Memoirs of an African-American Bibliophile. That's Charlie Bloxham there with his pipe. He took that picture in like 78 or 79. He said, people like this, he, he had a pipe. He'd smoke a pipe every once in a while. He said, uh, all the time, but not in the office. Smell like tobacco. <laughs> Charles Loxon, he said, Pe people like that, you know, it's, it's like sophisticated, you know what I mean? Like, he was constantly lampooning these bourgeois Negroes. Anyway, like I said, when, well, I forgot, I was, when he was on the phone, people would call, and if he didn't want to talk to you, he's still going to talk to you. Hello? Yes, we're looking for. Oh, okay, okay, we have a copy. Did you, did you call over next door? Well, yeah, but we want to talk to you. Why? Well, okay. Well, what, well, what, what? And then as they kept talking, if they was talking BS, he, the phone, this part would be over your mouth. This would get farther and farther from his mouth. So it's like, he would be like, oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Then we find him with the phone. Great. What's wrong with these Negroes? These Negroes. They don't want to talk to me unless, oh my God, it was hilarious. So this book came out, Damn Rare, Charles Bloxon. Damn Rare, and I'll end with this. Damn Rare is what book collectors say when they get something that you probably won't see again in the wild. He said, that's damn rare. And if I live another 50 years or five minutes, one of the great responsibilities in my life is to continue in the work of Charles Bloxon. And at the center of that were the years that I worked for Charles Leroy Bloxon. Because when I show y'all books, and you see me pulling books and stuff, that's Charles Bloxon. That's Charles Bloxon. There are a lot of things that take from a lot of people. John Henry Clark, who was his friend, John Clark come to town. We sitting in there, the three of us, just sitting in there talking. Him and Dr. Clark roasting Negroes. Oh yeah, what some of these I got here. Yeah, some of y'all know who we talking about. Who I'm talking about too. The people who say they discovered books. See this thing about book book sellers, uh, book collectors. 
When people say they discovered a book that was lost to book collectors, everybody got a copy in their collection. I'll tell you one very quickly. There was a guy at Harvard. I forget his name. Oh, yeah, I remember. Henry Louis Gates. Discovered our nig. Like he discovered the bondswoman's tale. The bondswoman's tale was in the collection of Moreland Spengarn and Dorothy Porter had, had it at her house and then they bought it at Swan Gallery. And then discovered, discovered, really. But our nig, I never forget one day Mr. Bloss came in and said, you know, Craig, how do you discover a book we all knew about? <laughs> I said, Mr. Bloss, what are you talking about? He said, did you see, did you see this article? And he, like he read a newspaper or something, he would just shove it at you. Now this is a guy who was, I'm not talking about just all state. He was like at one time, one of the top track men in the country. So he's a big dude, right? He got these big, thick fingers. And so he had a piece of newspaper. He shove it at you. Like, if you push too far, you about to crack my throat. He said, you see this? Discovery of it. He said, come, come with me. He would go in the back. He had a room in the back. Bloxon collected everything. Professor Hunter, his collection on black erotica. Uh-oh. He didn't just collect erotic stories. There's a there's a collection called Black Erotic. I want to say Miriam DeCosta Willis edited it. She thanks Charles Bloxton because he had to use his collection. He didn't just have the Black Erotica in the, 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 the yeah, he had the skin joints too. <laughs> black tail. Play, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, if it was black, Charlie Bloxton bought it. He did not, he didn't care. <laughs> That's how you build a collection of Between the Temple, Penn State, Norristown, which now has a Charles Blackson exhibit and museum, and whatever still at his house, I know it's a million items. He was never rich. This is what it looks like to commit class suicide. When they invite you into the house and you say, no, it's important to build black institutions. And these are for my people. And generation after generation, me, the ones that came after me, Narayan Felix, who was a student, at his, his mom went to Howard. He went to Temple for his undergrad degree and they sent him over there to the Blossom Collection. He worked. By that time, Dr. Diane Turner was the curator. She's still there now. She and his locker room, Mr. Blossom, was retired. But at any given moment, he might bust up through them double doors. But that will never happen again on this side. Mm. All right. <laughs> yeah. What's 1026? They looking yeah, for me. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just want to say thank you. Um, I want to thank Charles Bloxham because I, I suspect you wouldn't be here. And this is what oh, not. No. What legacy looks like. This is what you're supposed to pour into people. And I'm sure because of you, there's going to be thousands of people collecting books. and uh, In here right now. Yeah. Y'all are the grandchildren of Charles Bloxham. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yes. And, and because of that, Dr. Carr, he mm. will never be gone. So no. No. Uh, I thank you immensely. And I thank Charles Bloxham. And I thank Alan Locke. And I thank... Yeah all of the people that you erect every Saturday uh, who mm. give us not just hope, inspiration, but also a blueprint for what can be done. So uh, you go honor Alan Locke and thank you for that tribute. We're going to be continued. Charles Blox yes. never die. Not on our yeah, watch. Never. Not on our watch. Mm. Love, love, love you. you Dr. Carr. Love you too. Love you too. Bye, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Uh, we'll see you in the Nubian streets.